Let's revise the particle model of matter. I'm going to be following the AQA physics specification. However, as always, these videos are applicable to all exam boards. Okay, so we're going to start off with the equation that density is equal to mass over volume. The symbol for density in physics is typically this Greek letter rho, and this is just equal to the mass divided by the volume. Mass is given in kilograms, so measured in kilograms as a standard unit, and volume in meters cubed. Now this means that the unit for density will actually be equal to kilograms per meters cubed. Let's apply this to an example question. Can we find the density of a cube which has size of 0.5 meters and has a mass of 120 kilograms? Well, because each side of the cube will be given by 0.5 meters, the volume of the cube will just be equal to 0.5 meters times 0.5 meters times 0.5 meters. The density in this case will just simply be equal to 120 divided by 0.5 raised to the power of 3. And if we put this into a calculator, we are going to get 960 kilograms per cubic meter. The idea of density can be used to explain the different states of matter and you guys are able, should be able to recreate these in an exam. So let's start off with a solid. Now in a solid the particles vibrate in an ordered lattice. This type of configuration is actually known as a lattice. Okay now moving on to a liquid the density now becomes lower. So in a solid this I would say will have the highest density and then the density just becomes a little bit lower when we're talking about the liquid. The idea about a liquid is the particles can now flow over each other and uh, they're not vibrating in a fixed location um, unlike in a solid. The final state that we're going to be considering is that of a gas which has a very low density and uh, there's very few particles which are hardly interacting at all or moving at random speeds. It's really important to mention that when a substance changes state, the mass is conserved. For instance, if I had something like one kilogram of ice, once this is melted, it should produce one kilogram of water. In reality, there might be some evaporation here and there, um, but overall, the mass is conserved. Okay, so in terms of changes of state. These are actually physical changes because the material will recover its original properties if the change is reversed. Now that is not the case with a chemical change. So this is something that you may be asked to contrast in a question. Okay, now let's have a look next at a very, very important topic, which is internal energy. This essentially, you can think of it as the energy that is stored within a substance. It is defined as the sum of the kinetic and the potential energies of all the particles in a substance. So, in other words, if I have something like a block of some materials, these particles are going to be vibrating and each of them will have some kinetic energy because, well, they're moving. So the kinetic energy is the energy of movement. Where does the potential energy come from? Because those particles will have some electrical charges, there will be some forces of attraction between them that actually depend on distance. You don't really need to know that, but that's where it actually arises from. Now, if we were to heat up that system, so let's add a little flame underneath. So choose yellow for the flame, look kind of like that. And um, the so if we were to heat up the system, this will increase the energy, and it will do that either by raising the temperature or changing the state. Now, if we're raising the temperature, we're actually raising the kinetic energy. And if that happens, only if the temperature increases, the equation that we're going to use is that energy is equal to mass times specific heat capacity 
times the change of temperature. Mathematically, we would write that as delta E is equal to mc delta theta. We actually looked at this equation at the energy portion of uh, the, our previous video. Now, in this case, the energy, once again, is measured in joules. The change in temperature is measured in degrees Celsius. The mass should be in kilograms. And the specific heat capacity is actually measured in joules per kilogram per degrees Celsius. If we think about it, this equation kind of makes sense. So the amount of energy is proportional to the mass of a substance. In other words, if we were to heat up something that weighs a ton, then we'll need to provide a lot more energy compared to something that weighs a few grams. It will also be proportional to this quantity known as the specific heat capacity, which is, well, you guessed it, specific to each material and the change in temperature. So if I was to heat something up to to a thousand degrees, I would need a lot more energy. The definition of this quantity known as a specific heat capacity is something that we need to remember. And that is defined as the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of a substance by one degree C. And uh, we can actually kind of make sense of this. If we were to just rearrange for this equation, this will just be equal to the change of energy divided by m delta theta. Now let's do a little simple problem. We heat up one kilogram of water from 30 to 40 degrees C, and we need to find the energy required. We're given the specific heat capacity of water is 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree. Okay, well, our formula is that energy is equal to mc delta theta. So the energy will be equal to one kilogram. Remember this here, just that. We're given the specific heat capacity as well, times 4,200. Now the change of temperature will be equal to 40 take away 30, which is of course equal to 4200 multiplied by 10, which overall will just give us 42,000 joules. Back to our diagram here. Now, if we were to heat up the system and it's already reached its uh, temperature at which, for instance, it boils or it starts to melt, then the system will start changing state. If that's the case, what we need to be considering is latent heat. So if a change of state happens, the energy required per kilogram is known as the latent heat heat. And there's the official definition here that the specific latent heat of a substance is the amount of energy required to change the state of one kilogram with no change in temperature. The last bit is really, really important. For instance, if we're melting ice, the temperature of the ice remains exactly the same until the very last bit of ice has melted. The equation is that energy is equal to the mass times the specific latent heat. The energy, once again, is given in joules. The mass is given in kilograms. And specific latent heat is just given in joules per kilogram. So let's do a little example across here. The specific latent heat of water is given as 2,300,000 joules per kg. Find the energy required to boil uh, half a kilogram of water. Okay, so the formula, as we mentioned, is equal to um, the energy is equal to mass times specific latent heat, which uh, in this case, the mass is just 0.5. So a half multiplied by 2,300,000. Let's add in an extra zero. And if we divide that by half, what we're going to get is 115, then a string of four zeros like so. So this is the amount of joules required to bring half a kilogram of uh, water to boil. Now let's imagine that we're heating up some ice. So we take some ice that is initially quite cold. Let's say that it's even at negative 15 degrees C and we start heating it. What will happen to the temperature of this ice? Well, it will start rising until it reaches zero. And we can represent this on a very important 
graph, which is temperature on this axis against time on the x axis. So the region between negative 20 and 0 degrees, the ice will be heating up. So ice will be heating up and the temperature will be rising so temperature will be rising in this region we can use e is equal to mc change in temperature now in this region across here the temperature is constant so temperature is constant just the one given in blue and in this case the ice is changing state i.e the ice is melting once all the bits of the ice have fully melted then we have some water right over here and the temperature of which is rising as well and right across here, so we'll just do that in red, we actually have water which is in the process of boiling. So the temperature remains constant here and also here as indicated by those horizontal lines. All the energy is going into specific latent heat over here and then across here. If we're to carry on with the graph, I mean, we'll probably just have some gas across here and the temperature of that will be rising above 100 degrees C. But we definitely need to remember the features of this graph and be able to identify at which bit there is a change of state and at which bit the temperature is rising. And now let's talk about pressure. So remember, just as a little bit of revision, pressure is defined as the amount of force per unit area or force divided by area. Okay, well, the um, molecules in a gas are actually in constant random motion. Imagine that I have some gas that's been trapped inside of this box over here. And all of those are just individual molecules. Let's give this one some random speed as well. Now, the temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy. So, in other words, if the temperature gets higher, those molecules are going to be moving at a higher speed. Now, if the gas is held at a constant volume, if we were to increase the temperature, the pressure will also increase. Why is that? Because there's going to be more collisions between those molecules and the walls of the container. On the other hand though, if we were to increase the volume, the pressure will decrease because there's going to be less collisions. And if something like, um, if uh, we're talking about, I don't know, a tire or a balloon, if, we, if it increases its volume, the pressure inside might decrease momentarily, assuming that everything else is constant, such as the temperature and the amount of substance, etc. And now let's look at a very, very important law, and that is essentially Boyle's law. So for a gas that's held at a constant temperature, the pressure times the volume is a constant. Now I'm going to give you a little trick. This, All this means is the initial pressure, let's call it P1, times the initial volume V1. That's, that's a constant, it doesn't change, so it's going to equal P2 multiplied by V2. Let me give you an example. So we have a gas at a pressure of 1000 pascals when its volume is 0.5 cubic meters. Find the new volume when the pressure rises to 2000 pascals if the process occurs at a constant temperature. Okay, well, I'm just going to use my trusty formula that P1 V1 is equal to P2 multiplied by V2. Now, in this case, we're looking for the final volume. So, um, in this case, that will be V2. So, V2 will be equal to P1 V1 divided by P2. Now, the initial pressure is a thousand multiplied by V1, which is the initial volume, which is equal to 0 0.5. Then we're going to be dividing that by the final pressure, which is equal to 
2000. And overall, this will give me a final volume of V2 will be equal to 0 0.25 cubic meters. And here's one final note, guys, that if we apply an external force to a gas, for instance, we could have a pump on a bike tire, we're doing some work via this force. And this actually increases the internal energy of the gas, and this can cause, well, an increase in temperature. And if you've pumped a bicycle tire, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, guys, so hopefully you've enjoyed this video. Have a look at this one here, which will really help your revision. So go ahead and click over on this one.